are uh, looking at how you can adapt um, trees for regression. The two in the front! Yeah, like, what's this guy doing here? <laughs> uh, so, true mean squared error is just 1 over m times uh, the sum of these differences. Um, so, like, this individual bit is individual error squared error for a single example. For a single example. Uh, remember that m is your total number of examples. Total num examples. But this 2 here is odd. Um, and if you do more and more with cost functions, um, especially those that are squared, you'll start to see this 2 show up in more and more places. The 2 means nothing. The 2 only exists because eventually we're going to need to take a derivative. We're going to need to take the derivative of this cost function. And since it's squared, this 2 will end up canceling out. And if it wasn't there, then we would have this awkward constant 2 in the front of our eventual update equation. So whenever you see an odd constant um, in your cost function, more than likely, it's there just to make the derivatives easier. To make them all kind of go away. Not go away, but to, to cancel some stuff out. So yeah, this 2 means nothing. Um, this is just to... Um, make partial derivatives uh, partial derivatives easier or nicer nicer so that's fun i don't know i always like that mm -hmm. given this cost function let me make sure here yup so given this cost function, like we can actually plot this. So we can plot how a change in theta values results in a change in loss values. And again, if you have questions about anything, please, I, I don't care what they are, put them in the chat. Um, I don't want anyone to feel, because this is a relatively important thing that we're about to go over. Um, it's going to pop up for, like, obviously for regression, it's going to show up again in neural nets. Pretty much anything that is trained via gradient descent, like, this is the process it's going, that it's going to follow. So, uh, do I want cost graph? Yes, I want cost graph. <clears throat> so before, when we were talking about, when I was introducing regression, um, I came over here and, um, kind of drew out this, um, regression line for the parameters um, theta 1 equals 1. So this is the line for theta 1 equals 1. Let's assume for simplicity that theta 0 is equal to 0. So put a little star up here. Theta 0 equals 0. So this is just so we don't have to worry about it. So if theta 1 equals 1 Theta 1 equals 1. You get the following line. <laughs> at, uh, at x equals 1, you get y equals 1. At x equals 2, y equals 2. And so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> if we come over here, we can plot what that error happens to be. According to these y points, our loss is 0. Because y equals 1, y, um, because our paired data set in this case is just um, x equals 0, y equals 0. x equals 1, y equals 1. x equals 2, y equals 2. Mm. So no error at all. What if, however... We had theta 1 equals 0 0.5. And now I want different colors. Colors! Yes. So if theta 1 equals 0 0.5, and again, we're calculating our hypothesis as just theta 1 times x, 
Well, then, the output for x equals 1 is going to be 0 0.5. The output for x equals 2 is going to be 1. And the output for 3 is going to be 1.5. So now our line is off. The slope has dipped. We now have some errors. Error. We can hop over to our other graph that's graphing loss, that's graphing J. And we end up with, let's see here. So J of, we'll call it 0 0.5. It's going to equal 1 over 2M. M in this case is 3. 0 0.5 minus 1 squared. So this is predicted and this is expected. Plus 1 minus 2 squared. Plus 1.5 minus 3 squared. And this will end up being our total loss, our j value. So that's going to be 1 over 6, if we calculate everything out, times 3.5, which is roughly equal to 0 0.58. We can plot this. Maybe this is right about here. Probably not exactly right, but eh, close enough. And we can connect them. And we can do this for every single point if we want. To make a point, uh, let's do it for one more value. I want a different color. I want blue. So let's try theta1 equals zero. And so this means our line is simply blip always zero. For any x value, our output is going to be zero. Our error is even bigger. So for j equals zero, we're going to end up with one over six times one squared let me make sure. So technically, just so I don't get a, get away from myself, it's going to be negative 1 squared plus negative 2 squared plus negative 3 squared. Because it's predicted minus expected, we're always predicting 0, so we're going to end up with negative values. But luckily, the squared takes care of that. And we end up with 1 over 6 times 14 which is about 2.3. And if we put our dot up here, we can start to see the beginnings of a parabola forming. If we extrapolate a little bit, we end up with a cost graph that looks something like this. Does this make sense? Because this is, uh, this is probably the most important thing that we'll cover in linear regression, is this understanding that you can plot the cost on the y-axis and all parameter values on your x-axis. And, you, and as you increase the number of parameters, this plot will, I mean, you can still do this. The, the visualization of the plot will be more complex, but you can still visual you can still imagine error as this plane. How do you know it's a parabola? Does it matter? Um, well, so in this case, I well, I'm again extrapolating that um, based on the performance going one direction, that it's going to mirror the other direction. That might not be the case. Um, but it does, so the fact that it might be a parabola doesn't matter, but the fact that it's convex, does matter. Convex error, or cost function, loss function. K 
can cost always be minimized to zero at some point? No. Um, it depends on the data set. It depends on the function that you're using to... Um, Will not be zero, yeah. Because, um, yeah, it depends on the data that you're trying to, to learn, so your training set. It depends on the function that you're using to model said data. And it depends on... Um, what else do I say? Uh, I think that's it. It's cost and training set that it depends on. Wait, cost, training set, and how you're modeling it. There it is. Ugh. So you can't always guarantee that your cost can be minimized to zero. Uh, you can guarantee that there is some global minimum value, like this might not be at zero, um, but you also can't guarantee that your loss is going to be convex. <laughs> So if you have a convex loss function, and if you've not heard the term before, like one way to think of it is there is one global minimum and everything kind of uh, leads into it. Uh, however, your loss function doesn't always get mapped that way. Like you could end up with something that's kind of like, you know, we, 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 we. You have a bunch of local minima. If you have enough parameters, you can get it to zero. Um, for linear regression, yes. Yes. Um, and actually, okay, yeah, if all you care about is getting it to, to zero, then yes. If you have enough parameters, you can do that. But in that case, it's likely that you're overfitting, or that you'll overfit. So as you increase the number of parameters, you increase the complexity of your model, you increase its variance. And so you also increase the chances that you overfit. Yeah, like, same trade-off that we've been talking about. Mm. <clears throat> this is not convex. In points in minus one parameters. Yeah, exactly right. I did it! I learned it! I learned it perfectly. Yeah, it's... Thanks, I hate it. Uh, I love, that's great. Um, but yeah, the, the thing to understand here is that for any cost function, you can map out this type of thing. You can map out the graph of how um, that cost function will change with respect to parameter change. And this ends up being important. Oh, yeah. Just to, to give you an idea here. Da -da -da -da. Um, oh, no. There we go of what things look like if you increase the number of parameters. So in this case, we had one parameter. Gradient descent really hurts the brain. I'm, try I'm, gonna, I'm trying to make it as, as simple as possible. So here we go. So in this case, we have two parameters. So we held, originally we held theta zero constant, but this is what you might get if you didn't. Uh, for this assignment, will the training and test set be different? Oh boy, I have to remember. Um, I don't think it is. I don't think it is different. I think I still use the same. It's undergoing a little bit of a change, um, so that, like, don't hold me to that. But in the past, when I've done it, I've used training set and test set being the same. Again, not good practice, but yeah. The neural net assignment is definitely, you have a dedicated test set, so that's fun. But anyway, so yeah, same deal. As your, per like, every point in this plane is a parameter, um, so like, I don't know, can I, can I draw on you? Let me, let me draw on you. Yeah, so every point in this plane is a, um, is a parameter assignment and has an associated loss value with it. Assignment. And obviously as you add more parameters, you lose the ability to visualize it unless you can visualize in a four dimensional, five dimensional, n dimensional space. Uh, but you know, but same deal, you can still calculate this. This is going to form the basis of gradient descent. Our method for um, our method for uh, determining the best set of parameters 
or for learning the best set of parameters for a linear function to optimize this cost function. So gradient descent. So the idea, so it is a general optimization technique spell so given some cost function find parameters actually yeah find parameters theta that minimize J. <clears throat> and so how we're what we're going to do, the, the process is really easy. Step one. So steps one. Start with some random assignment of theta. Hmm. Random theta. And then over time, so two, uh, change them to reduce j theta until at a minimum. So what you're going to do, and I wonder now, I just just stop that. I'm wondering if in past years I have this example written out. Do 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 do. Nope, I don't. Or do I? Nope, I don't. <laughs> Back over here. Mm -hmm. uh, I will go here. Cost graph. So what our goal is with gradient descent is again we're going to focus on this plot for J. We're going to start with some random assignment. Let's say we are like, I don't know, here. The goal is to uh, use this assignment and its performance to, um, to figure out which direction we need to move each theta value. And ideally, we'll move in the direction of the minimum. And how we do that is we calculate what's called the gradient. The gradient is just the slope of a line tangent to this point. Do, 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 do. Oh my god, oh, I'm so bad at this. Oh, I can't draw this. Why did I start here? You know what? I'm not going to start here. That's, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start down here. Much better. So we can determine the direction that we move our parameters by determining the slope of the line tangent to a point on this curve. In addition, the, like, the, the sign of the slope tells us the direction, and the value of the slope tells us how much we move. So if, this, if the slope of this value is close to zero, we don't move very much at all. Because what this means is that we're close to a minimum value. Um, if the sign is, and uh, this is where I mix things up a fair bit, I want to say if the sign is positive, we move in the negative direction. If the sign is negative, we move in the positive direction. But like, even if I mix that up, what you're doing is you're moving down this gradient. Does this make sense? Can everybody follow this? Please let me know if you can't, because again, this is, this is going to come back again and again. So the idea is to... I hope you can hear Carl in the background. That something is going on outside that he just does not like. For those of you who don't know, Carl is my dog. He's very loud. Just to calculate gradient. 
slope of tangent line, tangent lime, for current parameter values. And then use that to update data values. So any idea how to do this? Does anyone remember how do you calculate the slope of a tangent line? <laughs> or how do you de how do you determine the function that will get you the slope of the tangent line? <laughs> Calc one stuff. <laughs> Partial derivative! Yes, I mean, I said it earlier, but still, thank you. Thank you for, for, for putting it in there. Yeah, so the derivative at the point. We end up taking the partial derivative because um, we have to take it with respect to each parameter value. So um, you do this with derivatives. Yay! They told me that calculus would be important, but I didn't see it until I got into machine learning, in which case calculus shows up all the time. I guess if you're in complex statistics, same deal. Um... <laughs> Man, spoilers. <clears throat> Anyway, mm, so, uh, da, 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 yes, so you do this with derivatives. T typically, you take the derivative of that point, and you're going to get, here's the slope of the line. For us, in gradient descent, uh, yes, vision, so here's what I'm taking that to mean, um, because I haven't seen this episode either. Uh, like, Vision's already dead. <laughs> yeah, in Endgame? So. Also, Hermione dies. Got him. Anyway. Uh, I don't even know if that means anything to anyone anymore. Um, that was a fake spoiler, but I'm about to watch the episode now. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> Fake spoiler. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, so, in gradient descent... God, what was I doing? I'm now thinking about WandaVision. Uh, okay. So, yes, we don't use the full derivative. <laughs> um, we don't use the full derivative. We use, we use uh, partial derivatives. And specifically, we use partial derivatives with respect to each parameter, theta i. So in univariate regression, even though you only have one input feature, you technically have two parameters you control. You control theta 0 and theta 1. Um, to calculate the gradient, we calculate or to determine how to update each of these parameters we calculate the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to each of those parameters because what that will get you so this tells you how to change each parameter if you calculated just the full derivative you wouldn't necessarily know that but by calculating the partial derivative, you get insight on each individual feature. Luckily, the update equation is the same regardless of the uh, regardless of the feature. So the update becomes so for an arbitrary theta j is going to be, so theta j, new theta j equals the old theta j minus alpha times my partial derivative with respect to theta j. Oh, 
Okay. So, uh, good enough. Mm. Here, Alpha is a learning ranked uh, that controls just how much of a change you make at any given time step. Um, and yeah, so the update for an individual weight is simply the previous value of that weight. Remember, we start with a random assignment. And so it's just the previous value of that weight minus um, this thing, minus the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to that weight. And then it's tempered by your step size, your learning rate. Um, with a low learning rate, you take smaller steps, so you don't update your theta as much. With a high learning rate, you might update it a whole lot. We'll talk more about the implications of choosing learning rates later. Yep, and so the idea behind this is... Um, We start with some initial, we'll assume that our cost function looks like this. We have theta, we have j. We start with some initial guess for theta. We'll call this theta 1. We calculate the gradient. And then when we update, so theta 1 equals theta 1 minus alpha times our partial derivative with respect to theta 1 of j. So using this, well, what we find first is that this ends up being positive. So this would evaluate to positive, which means, wait, yes, move down. Because we're doing gradient descent. And so based on the value that comes out there, we would actually move down this curve. We would lower the value of theta 1, and thus, hopefully, get closer to the global minimum. Oh, now's a good time to talk about alpha. So, look at this graph. If alpha is small, we take small steps. So we move, oh god, there we go, sure. When alpha is small, um, theta is going to make small changes. Thus, we slowly move down this curve. What would happen if alpha was large? Can anyone spot any bad things that might happen if alpha was large? Mm. You overshoot. Yeah, you overshoot. And what's going to happen if you overshoot? So in the in the um, not so bad case, so let's say if alpha was, uh, let's do it in a different color. This one. If alpha is large, you may overshoot. In the best case, you would do something like this. You might come over here and then back over here and back over here and back over here and just kind of oscillate back and forth because remember as you get closer to the minimum your partial derivative is going to be smaller because your slope is going to be closer to zero and so you're going to take smaller and smaller steps naturally as you get towards the minimum what happens however if we go here. What happens if we overshoot so much that our error actually increases? Any ideas? Mm -hmm. I've got to wait 15 seconds for the answer and I'm just, uh, bated breath. Mm. Could that reverse the descent in the wrong direction? In fact, that's exactly what it does. It reverses the descent in the wrong direction. So what will happen here is you'll see, oh, I've taken a move, and I now ended up with a lot of error. Oh, well, now my slope is, like, really steep. I need to take a really big step. Bam! 
And so you overcorrect. And then you keep going and going and going and going and going infinitely. This phenomenon is called divergence. Mm. Yeah, exactly. You move in the wrong direction. And you move in that wrong direction infinitely. You spiral out of control. If error increases um, over time, uh, you are diverging. So a problem with gradient descent, and really with all of these kind of gradient-based learning methods, which, spoiler alert, most machine learning is trained using some kind of gradient-based optimization, um, one thing you have to look out for is this phenomenon known as divergence, where you, um, you end up uh, taking a step that's so large that you, yeah, you overshoot the minimum and you end up higher on the error curve than you were before. And because you end up higher on the error curve, you end up trying to take an even bigger step to correct for it. And then you just keep doing that until you end up with infinite error and nobody wins. Mm -hmm. It's divergence. So by selecting, like that's why typically we try to use very, very small alpha values. So like a small learning rate protects against divergence. Because if you take small steps, the chances that you accidentally overshoot your uh, target to your detriment is diminished. <clears throat> so yeah, there you go. Um, divergence. And I think this is a good place to stop. Because we've gone over a whole lot. Uh, and as always, if there are any questions, hey man, hit me with them. Uh, so yeah, what have we talked about? We've talked about um, regression, the formulation. We've talked about the cost function that we're going, that we're trying to minimize. We're trying to minimize this um, mean squared error with a little two in front of it just to make the derivative easier. Um, we've talked about gradient descent. So it's a very simple concept. You simply start with a random, um, you start with a random uh, assignment for your theta values, for your parameter values. Um, and you up, over time you update them by calculating the partial derivative of a loss function with respect to each parameter. Will we cover momentum? No, we probably will not cover momentum. Um, I, can, I will mention some um, variations of this that use momentum, but no, after this we move right into neural nets. <clears throat> um, yeah, but good question. Oh yeah, um, so we talked about how, like, in general, you do this weight update. Uh, next time what we'll do, so, as you probably noticed, we haven't actually calculated this yet. We haven't, I haven't shown how you calculate this partial derivative. Uh, and so I will do that next time. But I promise you, it's very, very easy. And once you know that, you've got gradient descent. How do these methods compare against linear programming methods like simplex? Ah, yes, I was waiting for this question. Um, so like simplex or least squares or any of the analytical ways to, to come up with a regression line. So, um, thanks for having this public. Hey, man, thanks for coming out. Um, so how this compares, um, I would say it's almost like an apples to oranges comparison. Um, so those methods have the benefit of they will get you a single solution, like the analytic best solution. Um, however, those methods often struggle in that they don't scale. So like as you add um, more and more parameters or you add more and more data points, the uh, equations that you're solving get more and more difficult. Like least squares, you're solving a system of equations. And if that system is really, really large, that's going to be really, really hard to solve. Uh, gradient descent has the benefit of being like it might it's going to get you a good solution and um, it will often do it in a decent amount of time like it scales better to more data and to more parameters which is often why you end up using it 
And so that's why most modern machine learning is done with some variation of gradient descent. Because as we're de if we're dealing with these huge data sets um, with you know hundreds of thousands of parameters, this will still work decently well. Uh, so yeah, that's like you'll probably get a better solution if you can use those other methods, but you'll get a good solution faster if you use gradient descent. So that's the trade-off there. Excellent question. Excellent question. Now I'm going back to me. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's it for today. Uh, on Monday, we will have the second uh, programming assignment out, and it will be on linear regression. Uh, hopefully, you should or you should be able to get started pretty much immediately on Monday when it comes out. Uh, and that assignment much simpler than the uh, than the than the decision tree. Because uh, it turns out you can write gradient descent in about, like, three lines of code. That might be hyperbole, um, but not much code at all. So, yeah, you all have that to look forward to. All right, thank you for coming out. Have a fantastic rest of your Friday and a fantastic weekend. If you do have questions, please send me an email. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the class, I have a, an inbox full of questions that I am... Um, I am ready to go and address, but if you have more, please let me know. Don't feel like, because it's the weekend, I am unreachable. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, good luck, and I will see you on Monday. Take care. Bye now.